Last year, I released a video on the Red Komodo where I gave you guys my first impressions on the camera. But unfortunately, I only had my hands on the Komodo for a weekend. But now that I've finally purchased the Komodo and have shot a bunch of client work on it, I'm bringing you guys my thoughts and an in-depth review on this pint-sized cinema camera. But before I do that, if you're new to the channel, my name is Joe and I run a small video production company named Driven Films. And on this channel, I bring you honest and unbiased reviews of camera gear, breakdowns of projects that I've done, as well as tips and tricks that will help you to take your video work to the next level. Now, if that's something you're interested in, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the bell icon next to it so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Now, with that being said, let's jump into my hands-on in-depth review of the Red Komodo. Now, when it comes to camera reviews, I normally talk about the specs of the camera quite a bit, but since I already did that in my first impressions video, you can go back and watch that if you're interested in that sort of thing. Now, what I will be bringing you in this video is a rundown of what I think the Komodo's strengths and weaknesses are, and I'm gonna tell you which situations I choose to shoot with the Komodo over my other cameras, and finally, who I think should buy or even rent the red Komodo. So we're gonna start off with what I feel the Komodo's strongest qualities are, and the standout feature of the red Komodo is that it sports a global shutter. Now, if you're not sure what that is, I'm gonna give you a brief explanation. Now, compared to most cameras which have a rolling shutter, the Komodo's global shutter eliminates unwanted motion artifacts and warping of the whole image that you may see with a rolling shutter. Now here, I'm gonna show you guys a comparison of rolling shutter on a Zcam E2 F6 on the left versus the global shutter of the Red Komodo on the right. As you can see from the vertical lines in the shots, the Red Komodo's global shutter eliminates the distortion that you're seeing from the Zcam. Now, this is noticed a lot more when you're shooting at higher frame rates. Now, while this isn't a practical test and most viewers of your work might not even notice this to begin with, you are gonna notice a lack of distortion and warping in the global shutter. Now, personally, I find this to be incredibly valuable for my work since I shoot primarily motorsports. Now, I wanna be very clear here. Rolling shutter isn't a bad thing. Many high-end cameras have rolling shutter, and like I said before, the average viewer is not necessarily going to notice all the warping and distortion. Now, if you wanna learn a little bit more about global shutter, definitely go down to the description below and check out the link to an article I posted from CineD.com on the topic. Next up is the Komodo's price point. At $6,000 for the body, the Komodo has given plenty of smaller production companies or solo operators like myself the ability to get into the RED ecosystem. Now, from a business standpoint, I tend to make gear purchases that I think will not only improve the quality of my work, but make my job easier at the same time. Now, what we're getting for $6,000 here is a camera that gives people who otherwise may not be able to afford or justify a $30,000 camera the opportunity to finally work within the RED ecosystem. Now, while some may argue that it doesn't matter what camera you shoot on, I say that the Komodo has opened doors for me that I otherwise may not have been able to walk through. Not only has operating a RED given me the opportunity to work with other crews who are shooting on RED, but have also now proven that I could work within the RED post-production system. Now, as a owner slash operator, whether Sony, Canon, Ari, or even Blackmagic, from a business standpoint, you should consider what doors your camera can open for you. Now, next up is the battery life. And in my first impressions video on the Komodo, I didn't talk too much about the Komodo's battery life, but after shooting several times on the Komodo, I've come to appreciate the camera's surprisingly good battery life. Not only do the BP batteries last quite a while, but you could also hot swap them. Like I mentioned in my review of the Kinefinity Mavo Edge, I very rarely take a battery down to 0%, so I don't know exactly how long these batteries last. However, I did take note of where the battery is when I swap it. Now, I generally swap batteries around the 30 to 40% mark, or if I can't do that at the moment, I try my best not to let the battery drop below 20%. And the dual battery system on the Komodo allows me to use two BP batteries on the camera and use them sequentially, or I could use it as one single battery. Now, on a recent shoot, I ran the Red Volt batteries on the camera and we put the camera on a car rig and after about three hours of filming and only turning the camera off for about 15 minutes to change the rig's positions, I ended up taking one battery down to 5% before the Komodo switched over to battery number two. 
Now, by the time we were done shooting, battery two was left at 60%. So that's not bad at all for half day of shooting. Only two batteries, and I didn't have to change them at all. So to recap, the battery life of the Komodo when using BP batteries is very impressive. And if anything, not something you should be concerned about whatsoever. Now next up is honestly what is most important when it comes to a camera, and that's the image. And when it comes to red cameras, I've always felt that they had a very distinct look, not just the cameras themselves, but the footage, a look that's recognizable to most people in our field who at least know what they're looking for. Now, the best way I can describe the look of the footage coming out of this camera is that it's very clean looking, but at the same time, very organic. Now, while most people will say that Ari has the most amazing colors and I can't disagree with it, I also can't say that I've ever shot on an Ari or even worked with footage shot on one. Now, I have on the other hand, worked with footage shot on a red in the past, and I've always loved how gorgeous the colors look straight out of camera with just a simple output conversion LUT. Now, out of every camera I've shot on, I've had the easiest time getting footage from this Komodo right here to look good, which brings me to one of the main reasons I bought this camera in the first place, and that's Red Code Raw. Now, sure, not everyone needs to work in a raw codec, and that's been proven time and time again with various different camera systems where people have produced amazing work with ProRes or other compressed codecs. But for me, it comes down to how quickly and easily that I can get my shots to a place where I'm happy with the final look. And Red Code Raw allows me to do that. Now my process for grading red footage is extremely simple and straightforward. All I do is simply add a conversion LUT that I've output from Red Cine X and import it into Resolve. And I use that as my starting point. And thanks to the footage being shot in RAW, I can make any corrections to the shot that I need, for example, white balance or ISO adjustments. Then I then dial in my exposure and saturation as needed with my wheels, and then fine tune the shot by adding contrast or adjusting shadows and highlights, and then I dial in my look. Now, if you're looking for more information on how to color grade Red Code RAW, I suggest you watch the official tutorial series from Red themselves, and I'm gonna put a link to that in the description below. Now, ultimately what you get with the Komodo is a stellar looking image right out of camera. I feel like it's almost effortless to get my shots to a point where they look great. So as long as I expose properly and as for dynamic range, red advertises the Komodo as having 16 stops of dynamic range. I don't have the capability to do a proper test to determine if that's true. However, I could tell you that based on my experience in grading the footage I've shot on the Komodo, there's definitely plenty of dynamic range in these shots Again, especially if I expose correctly. Now, one thing that has always turned me off with Red is their use of proprietary recording media. Now, I've never liked the fact that Red, or honestly any competitor for that matter, could overcharge for what's essentially a standard solid state or M.2 drive inside of an enclosure. Now, thankfully, Red has made a surprising move with the Komodo by going with CFast for the recording media. And while some may scoff at the prices of CFast cards, the price of CFast pales in comparison to Red Mini Mags. Now I do wish that Red had gone with CF Express cards like they did for the recently released V Raptor. However, it's not a deal breaker for me, especially since I've come from Blackmagic and Zcam systems where I've already been recording on CFast cards. So if you've always held off on buying a Red because you were like me and you had a distaste for recording on proprietary media, that seems to be a thing of the past, at least if the Komodo and V-Raptor are any indication of Red's plans moving forward. Now, no matter which way you slice it, one of the most important aspects of any camera is the user experience, or in other words, if the camera doesn't make me wanna throw it in a lake because it's so frustrating to use at times. I have to say that the user experience is one of the most important aspects of a camera, at least to me. The Red Komodo's user interface was designed in a way that, in my opinion, makes absolute sense and has been easy to use in almost any shooting situation. The LCD screen displays all the information you need while filming, including frame rate, resolution, time code, audio levels, the red goalposts, as well as a histogram once you tap on the info section. And the five digital buttons at the bottom of the UI allow you to quickly switch from important settings like FPS, ISO, iris, shutter speed, and white balance with a quick and elegant sliding UI. You could also use the physical buttons to change settings within the menu system. Now the main screen is full of shortcuts, including the top bar, goalposts, and audio meters. 
And I love how Red thought of different ways that different operators could use his camera, and I often find myself using these shortcuts to get to where I need to very quickly. For example, if I need to adjust audio levels, I simply tap on the audio meters on the main screen and then quickly adjust my levels. I'm in and out very quickly. Now you can also access camera tools such as magnification, false color, zebra, focus peaking, just by tapping on the goal posts on the left. Now these tools can be toggled on or off for both cameras LCD as well as SDI output. Now, as I mentioned before, there are physical buttons and when mixed with the touchscreen, they add to the ease of use. My only wish is that Red found a way to add at least three customizable function buttons to this camera. Now, looking at this camera, I can't think of any where they would have put these function buttons considering that there's fans, media door, and all sorts of aspects of the camera's design that would prohibit those custom function buttons. So the only way that I think we could have added some sort of function buttons here or customizable ones is by allowing certain button combinations sort of like how pressing the up and down arrows here will lock the camera screen, which also I might have to add has come in handy a few times. All the interior menus are laid out in a manner that just makes sense. All settings pertaining to actual shooting can be found in the image slash LUT menu and settings for the project like resolution, recording frame rate, project time based in the file format, otherwise known as the codec and quality level are all within one project setting section. And like I said, everything makes sense. And it's all laid out in a way that I can quickly and efficiently change settings when needed. And seeing as I shoot run and gun a lot, this is extremely important. And while some may ask why I'm not shooting on something a bit more suited to that style of work, like the Sony FX6 or Canon C70, my answer is simply that neither of those cameras achieve the look that I want. My only gripe about the Komodo's user experience is the record buttons placement. And while you can tap the big red button on the top of the screen, I tend to prefer a physical button and the placement of the physical button here on the side down on the bottom just doesn't make any sense to me, at least for handheld work. Now, with that being said, if I am doing run and gun work with Komodo, there's a good chance that I'm going to simply toss on the red outrigger handle, which has a trigger button built into the handle. Now, when the Komodo was first announced, I'm gonna admit here that I was confused by Red's choice to give the Komodo a native RF mount. Taking a step further, I was also a little bit frustrated with the camera's inability to swap lens mounts like the Z-Cam, but with how quickly third-party companies made alternative lens mounts for the Komodo, I've been proven wrong. Now, with companies like Metabones, Canon, Wooden Camera, Kipperty, Aitzen, Tilta, Vocus, Viltrox, and even Makey all making RF to EF adapters, and some even making RF to PL or LPL adapters, the Komodo can quickly and easily be swapped to different lens mounts. In fact, if you buy a RED Komodo, RED does include a Canon RF to EF adapter, which so far has worked flawlessly with any electronic lenses that I've got. Canon not only says that RF mount is a future, but they've also recently discontinued a large portion of their EF mount lenses to focus on RF mounts moving forward. And while some of my favorite lens manufacturers are not currently making RF mount glass, plenty of manufacturers are hopping on board. So no matter which way you look at it, RF is here to stay. And in hindsight, I think that RED has made the right move by switching their latest camera systems to the RF mount. Now I've talked about all the Komodo strong suits, but it wouldn't be fair if I skipped over its weak points. And something I didn't mention in my first impressions video of the Komodo was that it's cropping 4K and 2K. Now, if you want to shoot 4K 60P, you unfortunately can't take advantage of the Komodo's full sensor readout. Now the 2K crop footage is not the cleanest and even with a decent amount of light, the footage still tends to have a little bit of noise in it, but I find this to be a trade-off for the global shutter. Now I don't often need to shoot 120p and when I do, it's not the end of the world if I need to toss a little bit of noise reduction on the shot. Now as for sensor cropping, I found a nice solution to that. Viltrox recently sent me this RF to EF 0.71 focal reducer, otherwise known as a speed booster. So if I do have to shoot in one of the crop modes, I can minimize the crop with this focal reducer, at least when I'm shooting with EF glass. I also want to note that 6K 48P mode on the Komodo is honestly more than enough to capture some really nice, slow, buttery, smooth, slow motion footage if needed. And not everything needs to be shot at 60P or let alone 120P. Now, going back to my first impressions video, I complained about the touchscreen having some lag. 
Now this was back when the Komodo was still in beta and I brought this up on the Facebook user group and many said that this wasn't an issue they were having or that it was a beta issue. Now maybe I've got like special mutant fingers that don't seem to play well with the touchscreen, but even today I still experience this touchscreen lag a little bit. It's as if I'm like not touching it properly and sometimes not anywhere near as often as it was when I was in beta, I have to tap the screen twice to get it to register my tap. Now again, this is far less common than when the Komodo was in beta, but I'm still having issues. But like I said, maybe I've got mutant fingers. Now the worst thing about the Komodo, even over a year and a half after its initial release, the Komodo is still extremely hard to obtain. It's constantly out of stock on B&H and Adorama, and unfortunately there are a ton of clowns who buy the camera and try reselling it for well over MSRP. And for a while, people paid that premium for the Komodo, even paying a thousand or two thousand dollars over MSRP for a used Komodo. And while some may call this supply and demand, I simply call it being a jerk, plain and simple. Now I wanted to buy the Komodo from the very first time I used it way back in September of 2020. However, I'm a very stubborn person and refuse to pay more for something than it's really worth. I'm also very impatient, so I basically had two sides of my personality battling out over whether I should buy it or wait. But however, I did end up waiting and I got a bit lucky finding a seller on the Komodo Facebook user group who was selling the Komodo package for under MSRP. And it also included various accessories like a cage, the outrigger handle, batteries, and best of all, the camera only had two and a half hours of use time on it. But the fact remains that even right now in February of 2022, over a year since this little camera was officially released, it's still extremely hard to get a hold of this camera unless you're patient and wait for your pre-order. Now, if you need this camera on the spot, you're gonna to need to either get lucky and find one at or around MSRP on the Facebook groups used, or you'll have to rent one. Now, I'm gonna be very honest when I answer this question that I'm asking myself. Could my work be as good and as high quality on a cheaper camera with the same lens? Sure. It could, but is it achieving the same look that I'm trying to accomplish with the Red Komodo? Honestly, I really don't think so. I've always adored the look of work shot on Red cameras, and it's always looked incredibly organic. And while sure, Ari is the king of color in the realm of digital cinema, I personally feel that the colors that Red's IP22 color science can give are flat out gorgeous. In other words, it's a look that I've been chasing and have been unable to achieve no matter what camera system I'm shooting on, whether it's Blackmagic, Zcam, whatever it is. And thanks to RED releasing a camera that comes in at just $6,000, I now have a very low barrier cost of entry into the IP22 color system. Now from my experience with shooting with the RED Komodo on several shoots, it's been nothing but reliable. So I know that if I need a camera that I need to rely on for a full day of shooting, I'm grabbing my Red Komodo. In fact, I shot a 24 hour endurance race at Sebring Raceway a few months ago, and I used the Komodo for the entire race weekend without it skipping a beat. Now from when I started shooting early in the morning at nine o'clock to when I wrapped up shooting the podium ceremony on a Sunday at seven o'clock at night, I shot over 35 hours and captured over three terabytes worth of footage on this little red Komodo. So in other words, I was shooting quite a bit on the Komodo and it never once let me down, at least not yet. Now to touch on the SDI issues that some people are having with the Komodo and without going too far in depth, I'm just gonna say that burnt SDI ports are nothing new and it's certainly not strictly the red Komodo getting burnt SDI ports. So far, knock on wood, I've followed the proper SDI protocol when using an external monitor and I've had no issues with my SDI ports getting fried. So in my experience thus far, the Komodo is honestly a workhorse of a camera. Now, speaking of shooting races, seeing as I shoot motorsports, I've said that time and time again, fast paced camera moves are something I'm constantly doing. And the Komodo's global shutter eliminates distortion when doing fast panning shots. I can also capture slow motion footage without warping of the image. And I tend to pay close attention to the work of my peers. And after seeing the work of my buddy, Chris at Flying Lap Media that he was putting out with his Komodo, I knew that the Komodo made the most sense for me and the type of work I shoot. 
Now it's become my go-to camera for anything motorsports related, as well as anything run and gun, documentary, just honestly, like scratch that. It's become my main camera for everything. Now one final thing that I like about the Komodo is its versatility. If I do need to rig it up for bigger productions, I can do so. If I need to strip it down for gimbal use or even some light rigging for handheld run and gun, the Komodo is totally capable with just the body and the lens. And having this flexibility means I've been able to use the Komodo in all different shooting situations, making it a tempting choice for every single project. So now that I've talked about the Komodo's strengths and weaknesses and how I've integrated into my own workflow, let's talk about who I think the Komodo is a good fit for and if it's a good purchase decision for you. Now I firmly believe that the Komodo finds itself at home with solo operators who want to shoot on a RED and get the benefit of RED code RAW, but can't necessarily justify owning a DSM-C2 or DSM-C3. It's also a great option for anyone who wants to take advantage of the global shutter. And finally, for operators or teams that want a lightweight camera to put on a gimbal. Now, on the other hand, if you're looking for a camera that's gonna be something with amazing autofocus, which by the way, the Komodo does have autofocus or internal stabilization or extremely high frame rates, you're better off sticking with a Sony or a Canon mirrorless. Now the red Komodo isn't going to be for everyone, especially for anyone who doesn't wanna take the time to invest in learning red's IPV2 color workflow, which to be honest, isn't complicated at all. Now it is important to note here that Red did not ask me to say any of this. I've never spoken to anyone at Red. They've never even sent me a t-shirt, let alone a $6,000 camera. So everything I've said in this video is my opinion and it's based off of shooting with the camera on projects for clients who are paying me to produce work for them. Now with that being said, the Red Komodo, in my opinion, is the best camera for me and for my business at this moment in time. It makes me very excited to see how much camera manufacturers like RED, Zcam, Kinefinity, and Blackmagic, and even Canon are developing affordable cinema camera systems that are approachable for smaller teams and solo operators. So with that being said, guys, that wraps up my in-depth review of the RED Komodo. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the bell icon next to it so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Until next time, Take care.